Hi, I'm Dr. Denbor, um, board certified and licensed naturopathic doctor, chiropractic physician. Um, I, uh, I, I'm absolutely thrilled to, to present Athlete Myths. Uh, it's one of my passions. Uh, a lot of work that we do here serving the American public is, is um, a lot of autoimmune disease, a lot of obesity, chronic inflammatory diseases, a lot of chronic, lots of chronic stuff. Just too many patients coming in that literally are on 10 meds. Um, I did a bunch of report of findings uh, today um, and uh, I, I was going through what I was all doing report of findings on and the majority of my patients, even little ones, uh, were on five medications or more. Um, so so there, there's a lot wrong with, with, with our society that way. And um, so I've had to steer the practice from what I was originally doing, which was professional athletes only, uh, which I, I totally enjoyed, to also now have an inclusive factor with autoimmune disease and inflammatory diseases. But that knowledge, treating the inflammatory diseases, has helped me combat all the problems that professional athletes come to me with. So it's been a really beautiful blend and a beautiful journey over the last 25 years. Um, I'm, I'm from the Netherlands originally, uh, so if you pick up a hint of an accent, that's, that's where I'm from. Um, and um, uh, over there, uh, athletes are so different from here. Just, just, to, um, just to give you an, an insight of what an athlete over there is, um, I remember, I grew up in Rotterdam area, uh, that once a year, the NFL would come in town and do an exhibition game, football. And us little Dutchmen would be just amazed at these huge Americans coming in. Here they come. And then, of course, they got the helmets and the shoulder pads, and you know, it's all testosterone. Uh, and here they come. And I, it's, it is so unusual. Uh, uh, the Dutch are the, the tallest people on earth. Uh, the average male is now six foot two to six foot three. That's average. And, um, and uh, here comes these, these Americans that weigh probably twice what we do. And uh, uh, it was quite a, a lesson uh, in, in sight and sound and uh, got, us, got us quite amazed at how different this country is compared to where I was living at that time because all we did was soccer and aerobic kind of activities and bicycling and running. Um, over here we are, are focused really on, on upper body strength. Uh, uh, that's very primary and over there lower body strength. Folks, how about if we get both? And why not get the best of both worlds? And that's what we try to provide here. So uh, Julia is going to be speaking momentarily as well. Uh, I'll let Julia introduce herself. Uh, and because uh, I think she can do a lot better job than me. And um, then of course, Tina is over here. She'll address if I get stuck with any food question, <laughs> Tina to the rescue. Wonderful health coaching, a lot of insight, a lot of experience and has been able to help us transform patients' lives, whether it's on the athletic uh, end of it to the anti-inflammatory end of it. Um, so let's have fun with this thing. Um, this is uh, the one time in the year that um, I get to uh, bare my knuckles and get a little bit hard-nosed. Uh, and um, uh, let's uh, let the show begin. So Julia, you want to take, cool. take it from yeah, there? Let's do it. All right. All right, so who am I? Uh, I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Denver actually in last October. My husband plays professional basketball, he's 6'11", so normally I'm overseas, but he tore his shoulder, which allowed me the privilege of meeting him and I was able to connect with him and I currently do kind of the behind the scenes work with social media and marketing um, and some program development stuff. So that's what I do as far as DBC, but I'm actually from East Grand Rapids. Anyone from the area? Nice. My sisters. <laughs> so uh, my huge passion actually is in sports nutrition because I was an athlete myself. Uh, I guess I still am. Um, I won three soccer state championships in high school, glory days, right? And then I went on to play actually basketball at Grand Valley State. And my junior year, we were national champions and I was the MVP of the tournament. Um, but amidst my whole athlete success, I did not find that I felt well throughout it all. And so I'm going to kind of use myself as a guinea pig to explain what was really going on, even though I had that elusive success. And my husband actually has a similar story, even though he's done really well, it doesn't mean that he felt well. Um, so we're going to kind of dig into a little bit about that. So just a quick agenda. We're going to do a couple, and actually Tina already covered this. A quick overview of the web of health, which kind of helps you to connect all the dots of that everything is connected in the body. We didn't cover that. Um, some common myths and then discuss the seminar coming up. 
So just a quick tip, did you hit on this by chance? Okay, so this is what I'm pretty much involved in. So if you ever have questions or want kind of free information, you can always go to drdenmore.com. We've got a tab for resources where you can look at our philosophies on food, supplements, um, integrative functional medicine, health conditions, healthy eating, all these kind of topics are hit on. And then the blog, I usually post once a week. Um, Dr. Denmore and I work on that together. And then we've also got some social media coverage here as well. So just a quick tip. So the web of health is something that Dr. Denbor and I worked together to design uh, just to really hit home on the whole fundamentals of DBC. So I'm sure, I mean, how many of you are patients here? Currently, oh yeah, great, okay, makes my job easier. So you probably are aware through the education of DBC that everything is connected. And this is something, I guess I failed to mention too, I'm doing a master's of science in holistic nutrition. So I'm actually learning as I'm you know, working with him and have the whole sports nutrition background. So as I've continued to learn too, and actually using myself as an example, um, just realizing that everything's connected, right? Like how many of you heard that the gut is connected to the brain? I mean, I've had gut issues, I'm sure many of you have as well. So we've got all these different systems connected and then there's kind of an outer ring that we, we may not really think about, especially in Western medicine, like the mind and the body and just everything really being connected. So this is just the main theme today that, and he'll kind of wrap it up about everything with treatment wise for sports nutrition is related to this. All right, so just a quick tip or a, a quick, I guess, thing to get you excited that this is not something new as far as you know sports nutrition and really taking this seriously and looking at whole foods. Um, this is kind of a, a new fad, I guess, with um, the LA Lakers. So how many of you are NBA fans? Any of you guys? Really? Come on, Chris. <laughs> All right, so I actually did a little research. on One of my books, the physician, is the LA Lakers physician. And so I was really geeked about this. And so a couple quotes that I thought were really intriguing. Kobe Bryant talks about how, you know, he's, he's one of the oldest guys out there and he had one of his best seasons. And part of it was because of his nutrition. So he talks about, my win feels even better. I feel like I can run all day long. A lot of that has to do with diet and being committed to it and watching what I eat. And then you have um, their sports and conditioning coach. And it, he talks about kind of more of the fundamentals about that. When they strip the fat, they strip all the nutrients with it because so much of the athlete diet is low fat, right? Which is what, how I eat. The current science reverses the pyramid. We're not telling them just to eat fat. It has to be the right kind of fat. And then finally, Dwight Howard, who's a sugar junkie, uh, he talks about how he knows he'll be more effective when I'll be in better shape. Unfortunately, it's cost us a lot of games. My pantry is full of candy. <laughs> I have a nightstand full of every candy you could think of. They had to clear it out. All the sugar is bad for us. It causes us to get fatigued. The less sugar we put in our bodies, the better we will be. So I just thought this was really cool because they're taking it on and they've been partnering with Whole Foods. So it's, uh, it's exciting stuff. So I wanted to kind of dive in and show you some pictures of myself. So as an athlete, you can see uh, this is my national championship my junior year. I'm in the front row here, it's kind of blurry. Um, but if you look at this, I mean, true or false, I don't really look like the picture of health, right? Let's be honest. <laughs> I actually showed this to Dr. Denbor and I don't even think he recognized me. <laughs> so just kind of being vulnerable here, I mean, um, they called me the shack of the GLIAC, which is a conference, <laughs> and I, uh, I referred to myself as the beast. So I had to be, I was a center, but nonetheless, you can tell I didn't look the picture of health, per se. Uh, and what was I eating? These are some of the typical foods that you hear of when you're an athlete, right? Bread and the whole carb loading thing, right? The pasta, that's important before a big race. And then you've got bagels and chips and how many of you like the Cliff Bars? I totally dug those. Gatorade, um, the fake margarines. Uh, you know, even, I put this because I actually used to just, I threw away hundreds and thousands of egg yolks when I'm sure you've probably learned, you know, as a patient of Dr. Denbor, that's the most nutritious part of it. Uh, so how many of you as athletes have eaten these foods or have had children that have eaten these foods? Anyone? Really? You guys have dialed it in. All right, so you can relate somewhat. Um, so for me, I found a lot that I was fatigued. So even, I mean, I was going in extra and working out extra, but nonetheless, I just wasn't recovering quicker, quickly enough. So on game days, I literally would like put icy hot just all over my legs. I, um, I would take the elevator to class 
And I was like, I lived in the training room in that tub. Like people joke, that was like my hub. I just sat in the tub all day long. But nonetheless, I still struggled with those heavy legs. Um, hypoglycemia, I had the, the whole shaky thing going on. How many of you have eaten a bag of Skittles? And two hours later, you're like, feed me donuts, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that was uh, a frustrating thing. And then weight gain, you could see my neck was a little bit thicker. And then injuries, I actually managed five stress fractures in five years. So between two feet, I, I owned a boot, literally. The doctor just gave it to me. <laughs> so, so you can see kind of some of the ramifications of the way that I was eating and I was, uh, obviously my lifestyle as well. Um, and just, it's not just me, other examples. Do you remember Kevin Ware and his nasty leg break? I was so curious because here you have this extremely fit man. You know, he's young and he shouldn't have like the crazy break he did. I mean, it was pretty bad. So I Googled it and the head of sports medicine at Ohio State University hypothesized that he was deficient in calcium and vitamin D. Well, what foods um, can harm calcium and the bones are acidic foods, right? So exactly what I was eating, the sugars and, and the breads and the dairy, and that's what leaches minerals from the bone. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that he probably likes soda and candy like Dwight Howard. And then finally, Kyle Love, he plays for the New England Patriots, and he was actually released after he was announced that he had type 2 diabetes. And I know obviously the football players you know, are supposed to eat big, but it doesn't mean you're healthy. So we're gonna go over, I think, five or six myths. I'm gonna cover kind of the first two. So the first one is about this whole sports food thing and protein. And I know that many of us have kind of heard all about this. I kind of dug into it a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk about kind of the optimum way of eating. So you, m most of you are already Dr. Denver's patients, so you kind of know the fundamentals. But as far as carbs go, that's kind of one of the tricky areas because as athletes, we do need carbs. I'm not telling you not to eat carbs, but it's just the right kind of carbs. So whereas we have these, I call it, it negative nutrition, the breads and the chips and the pastas, that really is full of nothing. So if you look at a food and you say, what are you gonna do for my performance? that really is going to actually take away because it's acidic. So if we think about chemistry, the body likes to be at a 7.35. Remember that whole chemistry scale back in high school? Uh, and when you eat these heavy acidic foods, it causes the body to have to work really hard to get that back up to speed. And when you work out really hard, your immune system is five times more susceptible to disease. And if you eat one teaspoon of sugar, it takes your immune system down for about four hours. So if you're combining the heavy working out and then the sugar, then you're, you're really opening yourself up to getting sick and, and having disease. And my husband actually used to have respiratory infections a lot during the season until he started eating the gluten-free, dairy-free way. Um, but it's, nonetheless, it's been good for him. So organic, I'm sure you've heard Doc Scholz on this. There's definitely research that this is important because you're, you're trying to put yourself in a state that um, is is as nourished as possible. And so these foods that are sprayed with pesticides and hormones and the meats that are pumped full of stuff, you know, that's obviously not the ideal nutrition for you. Eat the rainbow. Uh, I read a study that the typical American eats, well actually guess, how many foods does a typical American eat per day? Does anyone know? Seven. Three. <laughs> <laughs> Have faith. <laughs> no, it was actually 30. Uh, but then I read, uh, ironically enough, like a week later, there was a study about how an African tribe had 800 variety of foods. You know, they're pretty much untouched by Western food. So I thought that was really interesting because here we, we, well, we like to have the comfort zone of eating our oatmeal in the morning and our salad at lunch and the same things, but we're not getting the biodiversity that we really need for our guts, right? We want the, the healthy bugs and the nutrients. So make sure you've got the whole spectrum, obviously veggies and fruits. And notice what I did not include on here. Anyone? <laughs> yes, exactly. So dairy, gluten, most of the gluten stuff. Anyone feel brave enough to talk about why gluten is not a great choice for athletes? It causes inflammation. Perfect. Yes, I think Doc actually talks about the Tour de France, which he's slightly obsessed with. Um, <laughs> they mostly are all gluten free because they know that it's really inflammatory and it's linked to a lot of you know, issues with children and behavior, inflammation, all that good stuff. And what about dairy? Anyone? Inflammation. Exactly. And a lot of us are lactose intolerant, including myself. So if you're, you know, hitting on the, the protein shake. My husband used to do ice cream, like milkshakes, to gain weight. You know, he played for Wake Forest back in the day, and that was the worst thing he could have done. I mean, he did years of damage with that. So, yeah, exactly. So it's inflammatory. 
Um, by the way, anyone seen this before? This is called the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15, the Environmental Working Group. If you go to ewg.org, it's a really phenomenal resource. They're, they're always up on their research for um, chemicals and different new legislation around food. So just to help you with prioritizing what to buy organic and what to buy conventional, these are the heaviest, 30, 30 dozen, the heaviest sprayed in, for pesticides. So ideally you'd want to aim for these organic. The Clean 15 are pretty self-explanatory. You know, you can buy those conventional. So fat, I mean, how many of us have heard um, fat is bad? Fat makes us fat. Low fat, fat free, right? I grew up on this whole low fat fad and subscribed to it religiously. You know, count of calories, did that whole spiel. It doesn't work, right? We know that fat is a crucial part of our diets. Actually, our brain beyond water is mostly fat. Breast milk is 53% fat. It derives, it's the derivative of hormones and cellular functioning, so I guess you get the picture, right? So it's a crucial part of our diets, and actually um, it helps with endurance as well. There's a quick study we'll get into. So what kinds of fats are important? Anyone have any ideas? I mean, it's already up here for you, but we want to focus on um, healthy Mediterranean fats, so the monounsaturated. We've got you know avocados and salmon and those omega-3s, right? Have you all heard of omega-3? So that is very anti-inflammatory. I'm sure you've heard with your heart and your blood flow. And then you've got its partner, which is called omega-6. And they both work in concert together. And you need both, but you need it in a proper ratio, just like you need that whole balance. So in indigenous cultures, the ideal ratio was about two to one. And currently we have about a 20 to one or a 50 to one ratio. So I'm sure if you, if you know omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, omega-6 is inflammatory. So you're gonna have this huge offset and that's a huge marker for heart disease and obesity. So omega, high omega-6 fats would be um, like corn oil, um, what else, like safflower seed oil, mm -hmm. canola, oil. Yeah, canola oil, exactly, and, yeah, trans fats. So we wanna stick to the omega-3 if at all possible. And just a quick study, I thought this was really interesting. So just to prove that fat is important for endurance, they took, the study showed Three different diets that three different groups took on. The normal diet had 61% carb and 24% fat. The fat diet had 50% carb and 38% fat. And the carb diet was 73% fat, uh, carb excuse me, and 15% fat. And then they tested all of these three groups after a week of eating this way to exhaustion. And guess who won out? The fat group by 16 minutes, which is a long time, right? And this is for biking. So I thought that was really telling. All right, protein. So we've all heard that protein is important, right? I mean, protein, protein, protein. And it is, but not to the extent that it crowds out other nutrients so that we're not eating other food groups. Um, but other great sources of protein that we want to focus on um, are going to be legumes. That's a great vegetarian source with beans. We've got organic pastured eggs, preferably. The, the yolk, actually, in organic eggs is 20 times more omega-3. So even though they're cheaper, the conventional cheaper, you're getting less nutrition, right? Organic poultry, wild-caught fish, just to avoid some of the, the heavy metals and the toxins. Wild game and grass-fed beef. Any questions? All right, so bioavailable protein powders. This is Doc's specialty. So you want to hit on these a little bit? Sure. Thanks much. Yeah. So eggs, the perfect protein. Make sure it's organic, it's cheap, easy to digest. Uh, do be aware that it ranks a little bit higher in the food sensitivity or food allergy list. There's, there's a, fair bit of, a fair amount of people that are actually somewhat allergic to eggs. How would you know? Well, it upsets your stomach and it makes you tired, sleepy, two hours after ingesting. So uh, be careful for that because if you have this beautiful breakfast, three, four eggs plus say avocado, a little olive oil on it, that is a very, very high protein, good fat breakfast. Great for athletes. But if you're wiping out with energy two hours later, uh-oh, you're one of those. Does that make sense? Again, organic has got a lot more uh, oils in it uh, than the, uh, the, uh, the uh, conventional eggs. Uh, it, I, I know it's a little bit more expensive, but folks, you're getting so much more in an organic egg. It's absolutely phenomenal how many more good oils are in there. Hemp protein is one of my favorites. Uh, hemp 
is uh, only grown in Canada in the North American region because we have a, a bit of a hang up about marijuana. Um, it is a cousin to marijuana uh, and um, um, it's, it's uh, uh, not, doesn't have any hallucinogenic effects whatsoever. I want you to know it does not have marijuana in it. Hemp protein is perfect. It's plant based. Uh, it's easy to digest. Um, and uh, back when I was doing races, I would actually consume some of this on the long distance stuff that we were doing uh, because it doesn't upset the stomach, it's easy to assimilate, has some natural uh, fats in with it, um, good stuff. If you're consuming soy protein, I know soy is controversial, but folks, soy protein is good for you as long as it's organic. As soon as it's inorganic, it's genetically modified. 91% of, of our soy crop is genetically modified. Uh, the first year it was introduced about 10 years ago in England, uh, which is the first European country that allowed it in. Uh, the emergency room visits for allergens went up 50% just the first year they introduced it. Absolutely ridiculous. They got a hold of the numbers. England outlawed it. All Western European countries followed suit after that. Genetically modified foods over there are not allowed because of its high inflammatory rate, high allergenicity, and it just does things way beyond that. Uh, we'll do a, a seminar once on genetic modified foods, uh, but you want to avoid genetically modified foods uh, uh, like it's the plague. Um, Europe, by the way, and this has come from um, uh, having lived there and, and going back frequently, Europe is watching us intently. They're looking at us with great curiosity and are, they're look, looking at us a little bit like this. Oh my goodness, what are they doing? Because they are watching for the long-term effects of genetic modified food consumption. Uh, I think it hit that uh, organic pretty hard, uh, so make sure you stick to that. The brown rice protein is, is less perfect, but it is protein, and if you consume it with other colored vegetables, you can make it into a perfect protein. I love rice protein because it has healing action on the gut, and a lot of athletes, when they go into the heat of competition, whether it's soccer, basketball, volleyball, long distance running, uh, it, it tends to upset the stomach some because your, your adrenals are running so high and that affects digestion so much. And rice protein is exceedingly easy on a stomach, can actually be healing for the stomach. In fact, some of the detoxification powders we use here at DBC when a patient needs to settle down ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's, uh, things like that, rice-based protein is what we use. So great and yes. Sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. When you say brown rice protein, does that mean it's like extracted from the rice? If I already eat brown rice, I also get the protein? Uh, it is extracted from the brown rice. If you eat the rice itself, it's really high in the glycemic index, so it converts to sugar very quickly and is mostly starches. So there is some protein in rice and they're able to extract just that part of it. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So an organic whey protein. This is a perennial uh, favorite for athletes, but it's probably one of the least desirable ones. If you don't have a problem with dairy, if you don't have lactose intolerance, then this one can be utilized. It does, I have studies on whey protein, and here's what I like about whey protein, if it's organic, is it will stimulate growth factor. Uh, it's, it's a very good uh, uh, way to uh, get muscle going quickly. Uh, and it is remarkably cheap, which is worrisome to me at times. Um, uh, and but that's why we go with organic, because it tends to be very dirty. How it's processed is absolutely critical. It's got to be cold processed, triple filtered, and it's got to have the branch chain amino acids. So it's, 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 whey protein is, is quite good. It's just most athletes can't handle it. And if it's a negative, and they're consuming it anyways, because they hear it's the best, but what if it's inflammatory for you? It will dig into your performance. It will make you fatter right over here. It will not feed the muscles and do the healing effect that it's supposed to do. So be careful with that stuff. And over here, what we do is ultra meal. You have a question? Um, ultra meal, uh, which is organic soy or organic rice protein based. And it's got elements in it made from hops, believe it or not imported from the Yakima Valley, Washington State. The original research was done in Europe and they found that this particular concentration of hops has the ability to activate insulin receptors. I'm getting a little technical here now, but th this is worth listening to. Insulin receptors are found per, uh, on, on metabolically active tissues predominantly. So that would be brain, very metabolically active, heart, and yes, muscle. So whenever we eat and our insulin receptors are working really well, food tends to go there first then.
Does that make sense? So if we can activate your insulin receptors and make that really hum, make it work like a machine, then whatever food you are eating feeds that area first. And isn't that what you want for recovery, for feeding you while in competition, and for being able to keep on performing like you should? So insulin receptivity, absolutely important. And 40% of the United States now has problems with their insulin receptors, which is why diabetes is going up, which is why you see so much belly fat, which is why you hear so much, doc, I'm working out like a maniac and I'm just not gaining any muscle. Food is never reaching the muscle. So this is important. And why is food not reaching the muscles? Their insulin receptors aren't working and it's because of the junk food that they're eating. And it's because of the stress that they're under. And it's because they are eating too much dairy and they're sensitive to dairy and that wrecks insulin receptors. In fact, dairy is now considered the second leading cause of diabetes in the world. So it's up there. You had a question? Yes. Yes. Um, so should we be thinking about supplementing just a, a diet with these protein powders? Or is this really something for when you're an athlete you should be? No, you don't have to be an athlete to do this. Uh, we, we use protein powders for healing all the time because cellular repair is done mainly through protein and good fats. So it's important supplement and we want high, high quality protein. So sup sometimes we use nutraceutical uh, protein powders that, that, that um, enhance recovery and healing. So yeah, I'll do this for cancer. I'll do this for um, uh, diabetes. I'll, I'll use this for a body under stress, whether it's a professional athlete body under stress or fighting for their life due to some degenerative autoimmune disease. Both, both of these people are under huge stress and need very high quality protein to combat it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so when do we utilize protein powders? You want to hit that one? I guess Personally, I know my husband, you know, if he has a quick workout, he'll probably eat it in the morning, like in the morning if he has a workout, just because it's easily absorbed and digested. Um, or he'll do it both after his workout too, because it's a great, and we'll get into that um, in a little bit, it's a mm -hmm. great post-workout, because um, it's easily absorbable, and it delivers carbs and protein in a good ratio. Yep. So I would say pre and post-workout, ideally if you're an athlete, but if you're just a regular person, you know, it's an easy lunch, it's an easy breakfast, or a snack even. And if you do a post-workout, if it was an intense workout within an hour. That's, or 30 minutes. Yeah, ideally. 30 minutes ideally. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's pretty key. Yeah, good. Yes? I was just going to add, I was going to ask that, but then also, because I'm an athlete, so after I work out, I'll do the protein. Do you recommend it like before you go to bed for recovery in your sleep? I'll cover this in a bit, but it's very, very important to have a 12-hour fast every day which means at some point your body has to be without food intake for 12 hours. So if it interferes with that, no. But if it, okay, so if it doesn't interfere with it, then yes. So if it does not interfere with that 12 hour time frame, you can have a bit of protein at night. It actually enhances sleep and yes, it enhances detoxification pathways within the muscles. But the key is a bit and it should not be more than 15 grams of protein. That's the key, because if you go over that, now your digestive system has to work all night and you're getting a negative out of it instead of a positive. Okay. So here we go. We dive right into the pre and post workout field. Don't eat anything out of the ordinary. Oh, I've got this race this weekend. This is, a, this is a try I've been training for all year and I'm right at my peak. I'm gonna have my super duper extra special breakfast. Wrong. Do not do anything different. If you're on a junk food diet, then please have a junk food breakfast that day. <laughs> Believe me, the worst you can do is have a salad that day because your body's not used to it. It's not geared to it. It's not going, it's not going to digest it well. And um, I hope that's not gonna happen, of course, but, but in theory, that's what you should be doing. You should not change it up. And we get so many, especially of our long distance runners, into, in trouble with this, where they want, think they have to do something special because it's a special day. Do not. So, your main meal should be three to four hours before performance. You want it to have passed through the system. You want to have gleaned the uh, nutrients out of it. It's okay to do something very light, a half hour, but it's better be, it better be light. Um, it's, um, uh, but three to four hours is, is the mark that we want to go for. 
after we have worked out. So let's say you've hit weights like a beast, or you've just done sprints, or you've had the game. Make sure your body has the means to repair itself. Because how do we get stronger with repair of muscles after we have damaged it? Because really, it's not what we're doing when we work out or compete. We damage muscles, which then set to repair themselves, and as they repair themselves, they get stronger each time. This is how muscle is built, and it has to have the proper fuel to do so. Protein has to be part of that. And you can see the ratio that we prefer is four to one. During a workout, if the workout is an hour or less, yeah, I'll get to that one. If your workout is an hour or less, you really don't need to fuel up. You really don't need to. Um, when I go for a bike ride and it's an hour and it's a hard 22, 23 mile ride with hills in it, then I will have a rehydration drink. I'm pretending being Tour de France, I see them do it, so if they do it, it must be good for me. Yeah, so, so uh, and I think it might be psychological, I could get away with water, uh, uh, but, but it, it's, it's, you, you need to, you really need to uh, keep that one hour uh, in, in mind. Now let's say you have two or three games that day, then you better be doing some the whole way through, because you got to think ahead. Okay, it's not like that first hour you don't do anything, so pretty important. Um, the rest of the day, eat low glycemic. You don't want sugar release, it just damages it. You're already inflamed, you're going to get more inflammation out of sugar. And low glycemic foods are foods that do not get converted to sugar too quickly. A lot of athletes make the mistake of eating too many fruits because fruits are good for you. Yes, they are. But remember the tropical fruits especially, your pineapple, mango, orange, bananas, all those tropical fruits are very, very much sugar bombs. They are sugar bombs and you need to be really careful with those. Make sure you get your 12 hour fasting every day, which means that if you get up at six in the morning, you should not be having food after six at night, right? That's, it's just, you need the 12 hours. It's absolutely critical. The gut is our engine. And if you don't take care of the gut, your performance is gonna lag significantly. It is pretty amazing, some of the research that's now coming out that shows besides all the, 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 the incredible shift in thinking on workout and how we work out, and I'll share some of that with you later, the other big shift in thinking is if your fuel tank is not working, your gut not absorbing nutrients, your performance is going to suffer amazingly. And the other shift in thinking is fueling up mitochondrial function, and I'll touch on that later too. So this myth, hydrating the sports drinks, folks, if these drinks are illegal in Europe, you think it's good for us? They have made them illegal due to the food colors. They have made them illegal because of the artificial sweeteners. It's basically just a mix of chemicals. Don't put this in your body. It hurts performance. And I have heard from some of my players that yeah, this thing that they're drinking right here, only done when the camera's trained on them. Because they are sponsored. Gets thrown away, plain old water or a decent rehydration drink gets used after that. Can you get Gatorade in Europe? Yes, you can get Gatorade, but it's not our Gatorade. It doesn't have the food colors, it doesn't have the artificial ingredients, it's real stuff. So with sports hydration, use orange peels. This is old. This is old. It works. Just because it's old doesn't mean it doesn't work. How does this work? One of the main problems with long distance running, so we're talking ultra marathoners, we're doing, talking Tour de France, we're talking really, really intense kind of demands on the body, cross country skiing is you want to prevent bonking. Now, what is bonking? Through my college days, I was a sprinter for the track team. I want you to know my 100 meter record still holds. My 200 meter record got broken, but. So, so my coach made the mistake, well, Denbor is this good, he's throwing off these good times, and he can do it repeatedly, he can do this and this and this. Why not, why, should, why don't we just throw him into the 400? Okay, did the 400, man, he did pretty good in that. 
let's try the 800. So uh, I was thrown into the 800 without training for it and I got to know the meaning of bonking. And what happened at about 600 meters, the legs just totally gave out. Brain was still going. And I, was, I remember being shocked. My legs don't want to move. They just don't want to move. It was a highly embarrassing moment for me because here I stood, just, I can't move. And the muscles just totally gave out. Just nothing there. And um, what happened there? What happened is the body was in survival mode. It said, uh-oh, we're using too much sugar here and that's not a good thing and when above all we got to protect two vital vital elements for this guy we got to protect heart we got to keep feeding sugar there and we got to protect the brain and if there's danger of falling below a certain sugar level there it'll shut off the muscles that are not essential that's bonking you can bypass this little emergency thing by sweet and some, having something sweet in your mouth you know goo you've heard of goo that's sometimes used in the cycling world. No, no cycling fans here. Uh, okay, and uh, how does goo work? It doesn't actually work by fueling up your body. It does not. It just hits the taste receptors, just like orange peel does, in the mouth, and the body then thinks it's getting fuel, and that'll buy you another 15 to 20 minutes of full-out performance. Isn't that cool? And it's totally a neurological reflex. And that's how we buy extra time going up the mountains or doing an ultra marathon or doing whatever we're doing. So, pretty cool stuff. So, the homemade electrolyte drink, do you, what's that? Next slide, so. Oh, it's on the next slide, okay, thanks. Um, it's, um, aren't you supposed to do in this slide particularly? It's okay. <laughs> so, um, so, you hydrate during the day, drink up to 15 minutes before, and during the event, 12 ounces minimum per hour, depending on your conditions, really. If it's super hot, you're going to go through more. Yes? So, I'm confused about orange peel. What are you supposed to do with orange peel? Put in your mouth. Run. So Smile. You, orange. And then the 12 ounces per hour, so Henry played three basketball games on Saturday. You're replacing lost fluids at 12 ounces per hour. So it could be either water or... That could be water if it's an hour or less. Or it should be electrolytes if it's over an hour. Because he needs the energy. We need, we need to replete the magnesium, the potassium, and all those elements that we lose. And the electrolyte looks like this. You want to cover that? So, celery, apple, lemon, juice it. It's quite yummy. Okay. This will be on Facebook. So, yeah, so no worries. Yes. Is there an advantage to drinking more than usual the week before an athletic event? You know, we do BIA, and uh, we, we definitely uh, we measure total water, body water, uh, and it's better be at 60%, otherwise you don't have a reserve, ideally 67%. Um, uh, this, this is going to be a little bit disturbing for you. Um, if you're, let's say, in the mid-50s, say 55%. That doesn't give you much leeway because at 50% you're in dehydration and everything starts giving out. You want that buffer zone, don't you? To get from 55% to 60% will take you three months of drinking. Because, because the water, your, your cell, cells have accommodated to this, this amount of water. It's actually that size and it's like pouring water into a very, like a dried up plant, right? It just kind of pours right through. Yes, you'll be going to the bathroom a lot because it's pouring through. But every time you're retaining just a little bit more of it until finally the soil, your cells, start holding the water and now you're in good shape. It takes about three months to do that. So drinking more beforehand doesn't really do it that much. In fact, you're in danger of washing out precious electrolytes, which could hurt your performance. Yeah. I guess the best advice is make sure you're well hydrated, but not overhydrated. Yeah. It's very interesting. Uh, one of the, one of the ma uh, uh, a fairly major cause of death in uh, marathons is actually uh, overhydration, um, because hydration water is actually very toxic. It's one of the more toxic substances we deal with. Um, it's got a toxicity number of 10. In other words, if you go 10 times the recommended daily allowance of water, it can kill you. It's fatal. Whereas most herbs that I deal with, for instance, their toxicity ra ratio is between 50 and 80. 
So water is more, more toxic than most herbs and uh, medications, mm, they don't do so well on that list. Yeah. Which one are you taking with you in the endurance races? The endurance races, uh, the stir with water would be the best one. Yeah. The healthiest one, the first one. Even in, in competition? Even in competition. My husband does the, the far right one on the top. Yeah. 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 We'll do it before after. Yeah. Yes. Have you ever heard of oral rehydration salts? Oral rehydration salts. ORS. ORS. It's like a little packet. Yep, I've heard of it and um, I've read one study on it. This is a, a while ago, so I'm a little bit hazy on it. But here it was, is, is the conclusion was the, the uh, conditions have to be pretty extreme for you to need that. It seems like that's a little overrated, so we're talking an ultra marathon in somewhat Saharan-like conditions. Then it makes sense and only then. Yeah. So you got to be pretty extreme. Yeah. Yes. There's too much kombucha in a day. I mean, I started making it a couple months ago, and it's addictive. A kombucha is wonderful, but be careful. A lot of it is high in the glycemic index. Homemade. Homemade stuff is awesome as long as it doesn't bloat you. Okay. For some people, bloats them, which means the wrong bacteria for that person. Okay. Um, but kombucha is is absolutely awesome. It takes care of the gut. The gut takes care of you. Um, love it. Amounts maximal. Oh. Okay. While working out, no more than eight ounces a day. No more than eight ounces a day? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Again, too much. It's a great thing. Too much of a good thing. Not good. Same old, same old. Okay. So, um, coconut water, absolutely delicious, right? Uh, you can get that in any grocery store. I know Forest Hill Foods even carries it, d and uh, uh, Coconut water, awesome. It is great rehydration and long uh, favorite for triathlons, uh, triathletes. Beet juice, this is an interesting one. Five ounces of beet juice, two to three hours before competition, increases your oxygenation of your blood by 4%. Wow. And you're going, 4%, really? 4% is huge. Let's say you're playing soccer and it's hot and it's going into overtime. The team that has the best aerobic conditioning usually wins. So that extra 4% over that whole game is absolutely huge and can mean an extra 10 to 12 minutes of extra push power. So beet juice, great stuff, tastes great as well. Easy, yeah, don't overdo it, you will get the runs. And don't freak out the next day, the toilet will be red. No, you're not bleeding. <laughs> I've had a few calls. So uh, something very new that we're very excited about, Mito5. Um, the first real foro, foray into a rehydration drink that at the same time boosts mitochondrial function. Going to hit mitochondrial function in next month's seminar. Uh, that seminar will be on energy production. Um, but mitochondria is what fuels up our energy production within the cells. This stuff is absolutely critical. One third of our body weight is mitochondria. They, they are the fuels, the cells within the cells. And if I can get that up and running at maximum, your output is at maximum. And it's one of the overlooked factors in professional athletes. We have the uh, numbers from the best of the best and the ones that they've studied is cross country skiers, champions from Finland especially. They tend to produce our best uh, uh, cross country uh, skiers and these people are very extreme. And Tour de France competitors, again, very extreme sport. Um, to cover 150 miles through the Pyrenees, like yesterday's competition, was uh, two unclassified climbs. In other words, it's so steep you can't even classify it. And they went through three different mountain ranges all in one day while it was really hot. And they come out smiling. It is absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I think most people's legs would totally blow at one-fifth that distance. And they're doing this for 21 days. So, so when you do a core sample of the muscles of these athletes, they tend to be 30 to 40 percent higher in mitochondrial function than the mere ordinary athletes. It's what distinguishes the extraordinary from the extraordinary. So Mito5 uh, boosts uh, this uh, mitochondrial production very intensely. It is a rehydration drink and Dura is the one that's been used in Tour de France for about five years now. It is their choice for rehydration because it has all the salts in it, it's plant-based, it's good and it is good for you and it enhances detoxification which you need for extreme uh, performance. It also is low in the glycemic index and of course here we have the homemade ones. So any questions on rehydration?
But remember, water is our basis. Anything an hour or less, water. There's a lot of weird supplements out there. And I don't know where, where to start with this because I can blab on and on about this, except to say this. It is the Wild West of here in the US, there's no regulations. It's just the Wild West. And I have, I got clue to how wild it truly was when I started making nutraceutical recommendations and my patients here were not responding. I'm going, what? That's not making any sense. And I was blaming you at first, not me. And that was so dead wrong because you were doing the right thing, but you were using the wrong product. You were picking it up in the stores like I recommended it, like I would in the Netherlands, where if it says 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, you were getting 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and nothing else, no weird stuff in it. Here, at best, you were getting 150 to 200 when you bought 1,000. And still to this day, that rings true. If you're picking up a probiotic, there's only a 1 in 13 chance that it has live product in it. That's the latest statistics on probiotics. And I can go on and on. If it, as long as it doesn't kill you, the FDA will leave the company alone. It is so ridiculous. So it's hard to sort through all this. So I look for companies that do independent research, they have independent research teams that have no problem with independent, uh, outside the company, people checking on them, third party assays, we call that. We have, um, uh, they have, um, uh, quality control which goes up and beyond what what the drug companies have to do uh, so that that's really what I look for and first and foremost I look for clinical trials that they've actually used it on real people like for example uh, Fido Multi uh, that second one that's probably the very best multivitamin I can find and it actually is the only multivitamin in North America right now that's made in America that's had clinical trials on real people and it's been published so Phytomulti uh, enhances detoxification uh, pathway, so it helps you recover quicker and has the antioxidant value of about 15 cups of blueberries per vitamin. So it's, it's also the most potent antioxidant, which as you're putting out, you really, uh, uh, you really got yourself under a lot of oxygen stress. I'm now old enough to look back at my childhood heroes, and they tended to be soccer players, and they still look good. They still have, a, they have that athletic look, but they also look like they're three pack a day smokers. They have that oxidized look, you know, that, that deeply grooved face and just, I suppose some people would call it handsome in males, but not in females. And I, I think that's totally unfair. I don't know where that comes from, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's oxidative stress. And these people tend to die earlier because they've stressed their bodies and they've not taken care of the poisons that have coursed through their bodies because of the extreme stress that they have done. You've got to have antioxidants, you've got to do damage control, you've got to make sure that, that, the excess is being, that the excessive stress is being recovered from so it's truly building and not tearing down. The biggest challenge I have with my professional athletes is to get them to train less and to train smarter and we'll cover that. So coenzyme Q10 is the main mitochondrial driver besides Mito5 and uh, it's available in two and three hundreds and for, uh, uh, for injury uh, recovery we use tissue flex. Again hop derived but a different kind of hop and that reduces the amount of treatment time that we need for an injury such as knee, ankle, back, anything like that in about half. It's, it's probably the most popular product that we have here at DBC, Tissue Flex. It's absolutely amazing how it decreases recovery time. Or plain old, oh, oh, I overdid it. Let's get rid of the inflammation fast. This is your Tylenol, folks. By the way, Tylenol and Ibuprofen stops healing. It gets rid of pain, but it stops healing. So that's something that you gotta keep remembering. Kappa joint is more for joints and fish oil. It, EPA is the uh, uh, super concentrated version of fish oil and it's the only one that's been proven to really reduce inflammation in the joints. Hmm? Oh, I skip. There we go. Myth number four, immobilize when injured. Let's say you come in with a knee injury, ankle injury. It's all swollen, you're hobbling into this office. What do I do? I have a bicycle here for you. And I will put you on that bicycle immediately and get you biking. 
because movement is how we heal as long as it's not broken. Get that thing moving immediately and keep it moving. It's like when you're hiking, everybody knows if you're hiking, you sprain an ankle, better keep going or you might not make it down a mountain. And it's true, you've got to keep going. You might slow down, use your common sense, right? And if a certain movement really hurts, then don't do that one movement, but keep the thing moving and it is one of the best things for you to do. Bike immediately, start lifting. Layers of healing is being put down on that poor ankle or knee ligament the moment the injury occurs. Immediately you see new blood supply come into the area, sometimes excessively, which is the swelling. And you want that injury repair to take place under the stress that you need that joint to be in. In other words, I said that a little bit awkwardly, but if you immobilize an ankle after an injury, it will heal in that relaxed state. You don't want that, folks. You want that ligament to become strong, as strong as it was before, or stronger. So move while you are injured. Use common sense. Obviously, if it just flares away up, you're doing too much. Don't be stupid about it, but keep it moving. It's about being smart with it. Shoulder, the number one problem with shoulder injuries is frozen shoulder. And frozen shoulder is nasty. It is tough to treat. I see way too much of that. Get it moving just without weight. Go through all the ranges of motion, the hallelujahs. Notice how I had my head way back. Yeah, give yourself a double chin. It's okay, nobody's watching, except I'm on camera. And so, so get that thing moving as quick as you can and then wait as soon as you can do it. I would say two or three days afterwards. I dislocated this shoulder so severely it was hanging over here. It took two, took two doctors pulling full force to put it back in. Um, I sometimes joke it was my equivalent of having a baby and yes, I did black out while doing this. And, and, and so, so th th this was not a pleasant little thing to go through and I did it twice. And, and you think I'd learn. But in, in either case, the doctors told me, this is six weeks in a sling, you cannot move it, and for three months you won't be able to adjust people or do any physical kind of maneuvers. <laughs> well, that's, that's not gonna happen in this, in this practice, as you, as you well know. So I want you to know that within a week I was back in full practice, full swing, both times. I'm not saying it was gonna be pain free, but how did I do it? I did it by exercise, got it moving. I was working out with 20 pound weights within three days, and yes, I, uh, I think there was tears in my eyes the whole time I was doing it. This, this was extremely painful, but it got it back and to this day I think I'm at about 90 to 95 percent there, which for a shoulder injury like that is pretty amazing. So get on that thing, Be uh, as long as it's not broken, that's, that's, that's the key. So the ideal rehab, shoulders, strengthen back and forth with tubing. It's really simple. You can also do it laying on your side with a weight. Yeah, and then you get on the other side. It's the same thing. And do hallelujah exercises. And the hallelujah exercises are pretty simple. You get away from the wall just a little bit, plaster everything against the wall, and you go up and down. Hallelujah. Yeah? So you just follow it. Notice everything is glued. Tougher than you think, especially if you've had an, a shoulder injury. It forces the right movement, recruiting the right muscles. Because what happens with the, with, with the shoulder, we were created to be able to compensate. And it's a wonderful thing because when we do have an injury, all of a sudden a shoulder muscle group might be knocked out. Well, guess what? We got three or four others we can use and still get it done. I have a patient that um, was scheduled for uh, surgery because all she uh, tore the majority of her uh, rotator cuff muscles and uh, we have five major ones and only two were intact yet. And this woman at 75 was able to just do this and she kind of could do her hair this way and um, says, well, I, you know, I, I think we need to do the surgery. There's just no way. Uh, this mother of mine was very, very stubborn and she said, nope, I'm not gonna do it uh, uh, at all. Uh, so, um, Mom got to work, uh, her, uh, my oldest sister is a physical therapist and a very good one at that. Gave her the exercises, I gave the nutraceutical support and I want you to know today, full range of motion. Supposedly impossible because totally torn. 
three out of the five muscles. It's amazing, folks, what you can do. I've seen this not just with my mom, but with others as well. Yeah, so have faith in your body's ability to repair itself. Knees, this is a super easy one, but it is so powerful. Laying on your back, rehabilitating it this way. And if you have chronic knee issues, this is the one time I'll tell you to stretch before a competition or before a workout. Disengage the hip flexors because they're too tight in 90% of us. Why? Because we sit down at everything we do. Right now you're sitting down. Driving, we're sitting down. They tend to tighten up. We are a sit down society. What you need to do is stretch those hip flexors really well. There's a number of ways of doing it. Um, what I just showed you is one of the best. You should feel a pull right through here. That disengages the hip flexors for two and a half hours, which is usually enough time to get through the soccer match or whatever you're doing. And that will prevent re-injury of the knee. So if you have chronic knee issues, that is one way to prevent it. The other way is to work the IT band with a stick to make sure you lengthen it because oftentimes the response to knee problems is too tight an IT band and working that one out is also useful to do before competition. Those folks are the only stretches allowed before competition because the other ones will weaken your muscles and you don't want to do that. So to recover from these injuries, uh, we have a couple of really cool uh, well-researched um, and, and really well thought out um, uh, uh, ways of, of recuperation. Um, I've chosen the things that gets my players back and feel the quickest. Uh, we are known as the doc that's, that is not into restricting, we're into getting you back on the field as, as quick as we can. And we do that with chiropractic adjustments because if you look at any professional team, the chief physician usually is a chiropractor and there's a reason for that is remobilization of joints, realignment, making sure there's true truly good joint function, uh, that is number one. Uh, Tylenol and ibuprofen, don't cut it, uh, because they really just get you by comfort-wise, but they do not make you recover like you should. So chiropractic adjustments done specifically and well in extremities, whether it's elbows, knees, what have you, uh, is, is what we do. We also do kinesio taping, that's with a K. And those of you familiar with the professional uh, athletic world, you'll, you've seen this all over. Um, the gals uh, in the last Olympics, they made it famous because they had these beautiful spider uh, patterns of kinesio tape on the shoulders and everybody was asking what it was. Well, um, I want you to know we've been doing it for a dozen years um, and, and uh, kinesio taping has rescued many of our joints because you can literally watch the swelling go down over time uh, and we're talking within hours after application. It's pretty cool because you put the tape on there and you'll see just a dent where the joint has just drained. So kinesio taping stays on for four or five days. You can shower with it and it can be used in the heat of competition and it looks cool. Um, so acoustic compression is very new for us, um, new being two years. Uh, this has revolutionized what we do with, with a lot of these injuries. It has totally taken over in Europe. Uh, there's over 10,000 clinics in Western Europe alone doing this. Um, and it's been published so many times. Um, when I first acquired it about almost a year and a half ago, um, uh, what we found was that when you Google uh, acoustic compression or shockwave therapy, uh, this device had about six to seven hundred written articles on it. Do it today, there's over five thousand published articles. Obviously it's just taken off uh, like there's no tomorrow. And really what is it? It's this machine right here. I don't know if it was put out for me to show. Or, yeah. Okay. But here it is. And acoustic compression is lithotripsy. And if you know what lithotripsy is, it's a sound wave that travels faster than the speed of sound. It's used in the hospitals here for getting rid of kidney stones. It smashes the kidney stones, makes it into gravel. It's that powerful. It is extremely cool. And yes, we've gotten rid of kidney stones by accident. <laughs> so so um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, you can actually feel the shock waves as it goes into the body. And if you have an injury or trigger point, it can be pretty painful. What's that? Then you really feel it. Then you really feel that we have a man of experience here. And, uh, but we can dial it back uh, and it can be very therapeutic and a lot of patients will describe it as a good pain at that point. Um, and some people don't, they disagree <laughs> with me in that one. So, um, and, um, so, but you do have the ability to tell the, the technician to dial back. So, um, 
uh, it's, it's, it's allowed us to get joints back that before were surgical cases. So you're talking hip replacement here, folks. You're talking knee replacements. We've had people cancel, the, uh, these are elderly patients that had so much degenerative change, there's no other choice. But it brings back circulation. It brings in stem cells to re replenish cartilage. It um, takes care of the swelling and it just has such a rejuvenation uh, uh, type of effect on it that in Europe we're now using it cosmetically even for wrinkles, varicose veins and such. Cellulose, what's that? Arthritis. Arthritis all the way. Yeah, it was, in fact, that's how it was originally found because as they were doing lithotripsy in Germany, which is just doing it right through here, on re-evaluation a year later, they found that there was less bone spurring, increased bone density, and less arthritis in that area. And that's what got the whole curiosity thing going. And they started doing in vitro research and what's happening to the cells when you expose them to this. And they found, you're getting more detail here than you need, but, uh, uh, okay, it's good stuff. But, but they found that mitochondrial function, which is the energy house, went up, shot up dramatically, and stem cells gathered in the area and stayed there for up to two years, which, which is just amazing. So this, th this has, has um, totally transformed what we do in our office for uh, uh, recovery of, of injuries uh, associated with athletes. Um, I know the uh, Detroit Lions uh, have been in talks on uh, acquiring one of these. Of, they probably have by now, last time I spoke, and so some of the professional teams are just starting to get wind of this and putting it in their, uh, in their uh, rehabilitation program for injuries. So, okay. Stretching before. Don't, unless you have an injury. Unless you have an in injury. I, um, in my left ankle I have one ligament instead of three. The other ones are gone. And so when I do my run and I'm gonna do sprints, what happens when, I, when, when you do sprints, you don't watch quite as well where you're running. It, you know, you're just going for it. And if you hit an irregularity, there, there goes the ankle, right? You've gotta do it. So got to make sure that you grab the ankle, do about five turns like that. I just activated the proprioceptors. I loosen up some of the muscles that are naturally tight because they're holding on to that ankle. And thus I'm preventing a re-injury. So for re-injury of an injured joint, some stretching is appropriate, but the best is to do active stretching, not static stretching. And um, I was, uh, I, I was reminded of that. Uh, I, I was actually running um, a few days ago and uh, I had just done this and I was so glad that I did it because I hit an irregularity on, on, on the trail and I felt my ankle go sideways and immediately it, it corrected itself before I could even cor think about it. Uh, it would not have done that had I not warmed up that ankle. Yeah, it's, 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 I'm always in awe what the human body can do, these reflexes that occur without it even reaching the brain. It's an automatic reflex due to proprioceptors that we have. Um, so warming up is really the best thing to do. So if you're into tennis, then make sure you're just lobbing the ball back and forth. It, you're gradually accelerating the game, gradually accelerating until finally you're hitting full out, you're doing a few serves full out, and you're ready to play. That is your stretch. That is the way to do it. And if you watch Tour de France, it's, it's actually an amazing thing. After these, these, or before these huge events, you see all of these dudes on the bicycles, on rollers, working up a sweat. I'm telling you, the sweat is pouring off of them. You think they're wasting their energy, their precious energy. No, they are warming up. They are preventing an injury because remember, they're doing this day in, day out, and they're on there a good 15 to 20 minutes going full out before the race. It's, it's an amazing thing to watch. So, you know, being that we're older, right, in our late 40s, yeah. before triathlon, the swim sometimes is cold. Yeah. So I sometimes opt out of that. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. There's, there's a lot of reasonableness there. And, and so you've got to be reasonable. If the water is really cold, I would not warm up in that water. There's, but I would go through some of the same, from some of the motions of swimming. Right. Yeah, I, I would definitely do that and, and, and just mimic it on dry land as much as you, po you possibly can and then jump in. It's, it's kind of the must do thing. If the water's warm, excuse out, get in there. <laughs> Beautiful. So, cool down, that's when you stretch. And you have, say, trouble with your hamstrings, 
you can stretch that thing for five minutes believe me it likes it and you'll notice it especially as you get older you sit with that hamstring in front of you and just read a book or something like that and just lean into it and after about 20 to 30 seconds literally that long you finally feel it starting to relax because it's fighting it at first and then it relaxes it more and more and you can get better and better stretch into it so it's really important to give that one time because when you first stretch so let's say you just do a quick stretch this way my muscle tighten up right against it. It, it. it hurt it more than anything and I just lost 5% of my muscle mass. My muscle power there. You don't want to do that. Yeah? Okay. So, interesting little story and I actually thought of this today. This little interesting thing. So, here I was doing 100 and 200 meter sprints and occasional 400. And I had a bit of a confidence issue because whenever I made it to the final of the finals, so that's in the provinces or over here, that would be the state finals, something interesting would, would be happening there because I'd be by far the smallest dude over there. I would look like a little rail compared to these other sprinters. And we all know what these sprinters look like. They are beasts, right? They, they, they are just beasts. And here I was, little skinny thing. And and so I got to do some researching back then and found that the upper body is absolutely critical as its core strength for sprinting because a lot of our power comes from there so I started doing weights and I did them really heavily because I wanted to get a little bit bigger back then and yes it improved my times dramatically I also had this other little thing going because my brother was into long distance running still is and yes still can beat me in it and I, he, he dared me at one point, and he probably doesn't even remember this. He says, but why, why don't you just run every time you turn a year older, just run that distance. So if you're 20 years old, you run 20 kilometers. If you're 23, you go 23 kilometers. And so I was stupid enough to start doing this. And I so remember on my 23rd birthday, I ran 23 kilometers to celebrate the 23rd birthday. And that's when I decided uh, this is no way to celebrate a birthday. <laughs> I was able to do it, but did it without training, except this sprinting stuff. And thinking back on that, I thought, yeah, it's pretty good. I could run 23 kilometers without really training for it. But thinking back on that, it's come a full circle. Because we can get someone that can run a decent 5K to run a marathon within three months at a decent time training only two and a half hours a week the average marathon runner to get really good times trains between 20, 20 and 25 hours a week so how could we do this in two and a half hours now I'm not talking stellar performance here I'm talking to be able to do a marathon which is an accomplishment by itself how do you do that you do that by mainly doing sprints there's your 100 meter things that I was doing and waits very intensely twice a week for maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Really what you're doing, and one run, the run never ever exceeds 10 miles as you're working up to this. So how, how can your body, how can you do this? How you can get away with it? How can you fool the body into doing something so spectacular in, with only two and a half hours of working out per week? Remember, less is more. Here it comes. The, the key is to get aerobic capacity within the muscle primed and you do that by doing sprints so you're finding a totally different gear than you're used to and by increasing muscle strength and effectiveness by weightlifting. You're increasing something called a sodium potassium pump which fuels the muscle and replenishes as you're going and you're raising your aerobic capacity unbelievably. This is how you can do long distance runs, swims, bike rides, whatever you're into, by training less. This was first done in Tour de France because the, one of the pioneers of, well, I'm not going to mention names because all those names are now fouled up by, unfortunately, by doping, but it doesn't mean everything that they did. I mean, obviously, you have to be in phenomenal shape, doping or no doping, uh, to be able to do this. And they found that if they if, if, if they worked out at 
of heart capacity twice a week and you just did sprints instead of the long say 100 mile ride and added weights they could cut back the time spent on the bike by 70 percent and still end up winning Tour de France many times over so they started doing this with cross country they started doing this with ultra marathons and I um, have a patient in Canada that does 100 mile races all the time and doesn't repeatedly and he never ever runs more than 20 miles ever while training and he does it by doing this so just increasing your effectiveness of the muscle make it a clean running machine and when you make a big demand out of it it'll, it'll happen core strength is number one it's got to be it's critical what's the number one cause of sprained ankles in soccer core lack of core he said well that's kind of far removed isn't it potholes or something like that no when this isn't strong enough then you get something called pelvic tilt which rotates the knee in which makes the which makes things suffer down in the ankle area so yes Good question. Uh, so I assume that sprinting outside is the ideal situation it is but Treadmill is exactly the same. Just make sure it's done on different, different angles. Because the beauty of running outside is the varying conditions from wind or slope of the track, uh, slight ups and downs, which obviously if, 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 if you do it on a treadmill, there's too much of the sameness. You're only training the same muscle. So you got, if, as long as you're doing it on different angles, you're good. And for how long? You would have to mimic. It depends on what, what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to achieve just maximum overall athletic capability, the sprint only needs to be 100 to 150 meters. If you're into long distance running, it's got to be 400 to 600 meters. Yeah, so fair. Uh, so that there's a difference. How many? Oh, four is the minimum, and eight is the maximum. Not more than two minutes. Yeah, 90 seconds seems to be where most of the research. And that's from McMaster University in Canada. They do most of the research on this one. Yeah, four is your minimum. Feeling good. Go eight. Yeah. After that, you get too much, uh, so much uh, uh, destruction of muscle uh, fibers that the negative destruction is more greater than the recovery ability. So, yeah. And this this rule is for swimmers. It's for cyclists. In fact, cyclists they actually only do three. Yeah. There's that seems like the sweet spot. So. Take time off. There should be two days every week where you're not really doing much. Have fun. Walk. Yeah, very hard for athletes. It's where most of your strength gains get made is your days off. That's when you get strong. So, folks, let's look at the whole picture. How do we get an athlete to peak performance? We work with their food. We modify their exercise that we just talked about. We use acoustic compression to rebuild from energy. We make sure they're fully aligned so the nervous system is on and the muscles are getting the signals that they're supposed to be getting. That they have the reflexes, eye, hind, ball coordination. We engage in anti-inflammatory living through lifestyle coaching. We preach vegetables, oils, fats, clean proteins. We make sure that if they're toxic in any way, in other words, they're sore far too long after exercise, that means their detoxification pathways are not up and running and we try to enhance liver and kidney function. We make sure that they have a sense of community, a sense of support, because psychologically that's absolutely critical. If psychologically we become unbalanced because we're unhappy, we break down injuries. We make sure that you have a half-decent doctor on board that knows what they're doing, that, that talks to walk and does some of this stuff on their own. Okay, it's not really confidence and inspiring. It's inspiring if you're training for a triathlon and here comes the doctor with a big, right? It, it's, it's, you've got you to gotta be able to trust your doctor on this one. <laughs> but you'd be surprised how often it happens. Yeah. So, uh, make sure the nutraceuticals are reputable. They have research behind them that they actually work and are made for athletes. Food is king, let food be your medicine. 
Tina has a great saying that I love, and it is this one, and Tina may have gotten it from someone else, because um, you know how that goes, it goes all over the place, but he, here it is, is why not give your money to the farmers now rather than to the doctors later? And I love that one, it's, it's so true, because nothing is more expensive than being ill. And uh, yeah, it costs a little bit more money to buy really good food, but believe me, the benefits of it are unbelievable. I just, uh, one of my patients said today, well doc, before I can make some of those changes, I really gotta finish what I have. And because he was eating stuff that was poisonous to him, he, he says, nope, I'm gonna go through my pantry before I change. And I'm thinking, and I tried to convince him to just dump it or give it to somebody else to poison them. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and but there seems to be this thing, no, I bought it, and even if it's gonna hurt me, I'm gonna finish it. No, just, all right. Exercise less, less is more. Optimizing your energy, this is where we're gonna really dig into the mitochondria. Which nutrients matter, but we're also going to go into weird stuff, things that rob our energy, like the clock next to your bed. The Wi-Fi that's in your house. Your cell phone that's sitting right here. You think those chronic injuries in that groin might be from something? It could be from radiation. If it can reduce sperm production by 70% in six weeks, if you, wear your, if you wear your phone right here, what is it doing to mitochondrial function in the tissues right underneath? I saw a picture just a couple of weeks ago that one of my colleagues took because we're starting to see breast cancer in girls that are 21 through 23 years old. Lots of them. And these breast cancers are right where they put their cell phone in the bra because at 15 they thought that was the coolest thing going. It's the exact outline, folks, and we're starting to see it. We're looking at a ticking time bomb when it comes to energy production, and we're talking the weird stuff that's out there, and we're even gonna talk about sunspots and how it affects us. We're gonna be talking about mitochondrial function, function at, at a cellular level, and I'm kind of excited about that one. Kind of weird, but very science-driven and science-proven.